Did, did everybody get the answer to that last one about how the mechanical integrity test is performed? Okay, well let me just take a quick second to talk about that. So, uh, oftentimes, uh, well, the, these proposals that are being proposed in Pennsylvania are, are actually existing uh, wells that were formerly used as production wells. So they may have been producing very small amounts of gas out of, say, like the Medina Formation, and now they want to convert it into a disposal well. So what they will have to do sometimes is put in another string of casing that they will cement to the surface and then they have this production tube, say it might be only four inches or, or two and a half inches even, that is then slipped inside that, that string of casing that they just cemented in. It's put on a device that's called a packer. And the packer, it, it looks like rigatoni pasta if you, if you think about it. So it, it's a long tubular device that actually swells up and pushes out against the formation. And so you're, you're pumping the fluid down through that small tube, uh, the injection tube, and, that, and the, the, the fluid is then pushed out into uh, the former gas producing formation into the interstitial spaces of the rock. And so when they're doing their integrity test, they are, they are putting pressure between that, that, that injection tube and, and the next widest string of casing. Because there's a, there's a space in there. And they'll, they'll put pressure on it and then shut it in and monitor to see that it's holding that pressure, that it's not somehow the, the, the injected, they'll use a fluid, that the fluid is not somehow getting that around the packer uh, on, the, on the injection tube. And if it's capable of holding that pressure for 30 minutes without a decrease of 5% um, of, of the total pressure, it's deemed to have uh, mechanical integrity. So some of the ways that you would note that a well, uh, an injection well, um, has lost some of its integrity. One could be that you actually note fluid between the injection tube and the outermost string of casing. And somehow fluid is getting up around the outside of that packer and into the well bore. Or the other is, is as, you're, as you are injecting fluid, you note pressure building up between those two strings of casing. There really shouldn't be any pressure there unless, unless somehow it, there, there's a, a leak in the, in the packer. It does not necessarily mean, of course, that you're having a groundwater contamination problem because you also have other strings of casing in that well that, that isolate fresh groundwater from deeper formations. It just means that the, 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 the packer is not functioning as intended and they'll have to pull the ejection tubing out and, and then reset, reset a new packer, put it back in and demonstrate integrity. So, and, and I might be able to get to a number of these other questions on, I'm not a UI injection expert, but I can I'm pretty converse in it, so, so we have some time. I'm willing to stay here as long as, as necessary to, to address, uh, address your questions. So, um, Well, that was, that's not the way I really wanted to start out, but I do uh, want to thank you all for inviting me to come and, and talk with you here tonight. Um, as I was talking with uh, commis uh, Commissioner uh, before we started, um, Harrisburg can sometimes feel like a very, very far away from shale gas activity uh, in the northern tier. And I'm sure for the folks here who are contemplating some of the opportunities and challenges associated with, with this industry, Harrisburg might feel a thousand miles away, that, that folks are not necessarily paying attention to what's really going on, aren't, aren't in tune to things that you're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, coming here tonight is really, it really is uh, a privilege for me. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and on the truck, and on the drive up, I was, I was passing through some of my, you know, my favorite spots. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and one of the things I really like to do is come up to the Pennsylvania Wilds to, to go, to go backpacking and, and fishing. And I was thinking though about how um, every major resource extraction industry in the history of this. Commonwealth has, has really left a scar and in some cases um, have, have, have left a legacy of pollution that we're we are going to be dealing with for a, for a very long period of time. I was thinking about that and I was thinking about the all of the well I'll, I'll call it incredible opportunities that, that domestic gas and oil production actually presents for, for our country and not just the economic side of it, which a lot of folks have spent uh, a, a lot of time talking about, 
but from my perspective, even in environmental benefits. Uh, we're already seeing that with the displacement of coal as a source of uh, electricity uh, generation. We're seeing that from a climate change perspective, um, CO2 emissions in the United States are, are down compared to basically all other countries in the world. Uh, we're seeing it certainly from a decline in, in uh, sulfur dioxide emissions, like 500,000 ton de decline in, in those emissions. Um, we're, we're, we're going to see it in, in a decrease in the amount of waste that's, that's generated. Coal-fired power plants generate just an extraordinary amount of, amount of waste. Uh, the, these coal slurries. I don't know if you recall, there was an incident down in Tennessee where one of these lagoons went loose and, and wiped out a whole, a whole community. Uh, we're going to see it from overall water consumption. You know, the scrubber on a coal-fired power plant uses 5 million gallons of water a day to, to operate as compared to the amount of water that's being used for Marcellus. Um, but while, while there is, there are these very real um, positive benefits that can occur, you know, we cannot trade that in for our, our groundwater resources. We can't trade it in for, for uh, pollution to our streams and rivers through mismanagement of waste. Um, I don't think that we can accept a, a legacy uh, from this industry other than uh, one of, of, of positive benefits. We know too much. We don't have to repeat the mistakes of the past where we, we value the, 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 the resource, the natural resource, above the quality of, of, of our environment. I think folks value uh, clean water and clean air just as much as they value um, abundant energy. So while you know, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that everything that DEP has done so far has been perfect. And I'm certainly not going to stand here and tell you that everything the industry has done so far has been perfect. But what I can promise you is that my staff and I are absolutely committed to ensuring that our rules are followed, that this activity is done in a safe and environmentally protected way. And I think that Pennsylvania is, you know, we're sitting on top of a, of a world-class resource. It's the second largest gas reserve in the world in the world. We've got world-class operators that are here. I mean, these guys can drill a well in places where human beings shouldn't even be living, let alone working in, and, uh, and, and drilling wells. But Pennsylvania, it's, it's our home. Uh, like I said, I grew up here. Um, I spent a lot of time in your backyard, as a matter of fact. Um, I want to take my seven-year-old son up here and teach him to do the same things that my dad taught me to do. And so I'm, I'm going to demand world-class performance. Um, and candidly, I think, I think we are indeed getting there. So what I'd like to do today is uh, just go through an overview of kind of where we are statistically, you know, wells, inspections, enforcement, some of the things that we've done um, in the past to, to uh, develop a regulatory program. And then I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the future. And I'm going to try and focus as much as I can on, on water quality protection as well as managing wastewater, uh, which I know is the focus of, of the uh, discussion here. So, oops. Yeah, yeah, I need to. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I sent uh, Bob a, a PowerPoint that I was working on, and I was working on it pretty late the other night, and then when I woke up in the morning, I said, you know what, I've got some more to say. So I added some different slides, and I kind of tricked them here by putting in a different, a different slideshow. So Pennsylvania, you know, the Marcellus is getting all of the, uh, all of the attention, um, and so is the Utica. Uh, but there are other shale, uh, shale formations that uh, have traditionally been explored in Pennsylvania, and some that you might not have heard about. Uh, the one, the two in particular, I wanted to point out is the uh, the Geneseo and the Burkett. Um, over in Butler County, uh, for example, Rex Energy is developing uh, Burkett shale wells that look, have Marcellus-like production numbers. So that is a shale formation that's actually above the Marcellus. Uh, Utica development, while while still in its infant stages in Pennsylvania, is indeed occurring. We're going to see that a little bit more in like the Mercer, Crawford, Venango County areas. 
But although if you look on a map, if you see a geologic map, it's going to show the Utica as being much more expansive than, than the Marcellus. But we think, right here, we think that this is about the extent of, of its productive reach. So significantly smaller than, than the Marcellus. Here, you, I'm sorry you can't quite see this, but this would be a dry gas area. And as you move farther east, you start to encounter uh, natural gas liquids. And then if you get into um, western Ohio, you can, they, they're actually producing oil out of, out of the Utica. So a number of shale, shales that, that are, uh, could be uh, developed here in Pennsylvania. My hope, of course, is that they're all developed off of the same, the same pad using the same infrastructure to minimize the, the footprint that, uh, that would otherwise uh, result. Um, here's our shale well development history in Pennsylvania. Uh, as 2000, 2008 is really when, when folks really started to pay attention. Obviously, the first well drilled in the very end of 2004. Um, but still, you know, at that time, 2008, not a whole lot of activity. I really want you guys to kind of recall, I'll, I'll try to help you recall some of these numbers because I've got a story to tell here. Um, obviously, with the decline in natural gas prices, we've seen uh, the concomitant result in uh, decline in, in, in drilling. Um, while we have seen some fluctuations in the number of wells drilled, uh, one constant is the increased uh, field presence of DEP staff. Um, we began uh, adding staff in 2009, continued into 2010. Um, we did that by increasing our well permit fee. So all 202 people that, that work with me to, to protect the environment while, the, while this activity is occurring are completely funded off of, the, off of this permit fee. So we don't, there's no tax dollars going to buy our trucks or computers or pay salaries. It's all being funded by the industry. Uh, we went from a staff of approximately 65 to 70 folks, to I said, to 202 today. And the results show that. Um, when, when well drilling was really taking off in 2010, we were able to uh, do about 5,000 inspections. Last year, uh, over 12,500 inspections by, by our staff. Um, And again, I told you I had a story to tell, and, and really what it is is the, uh, the improved compliance within the industry. So recall, in 2008, we had 368 wells drilled, 240 violations. 2010, 1,609 wells, 1,282 violations. That is failure. That, that, is, that is not the world-class performance that, I, that I'm talking about. But then look at 2012. Recall, we did 5,000 inspections in 2010. Same number of wells, 12,000 inspections in 2012. Double the number of inspections. Basically half the violations noted. That is because of superior on-the-ground performance that we're seeing in Pennsylvania. I'm going to give the industry some credit. They, they uh, decided that basically they didn't, that they, they didn't want to deal with us anymore. So they started to institute some of the best well construction and pad construction practices that are occurring, I believe, in the world. And as a result, we're seeing the kind of uh, improved performance that, that, that we demand. Um, and all the while, another sign of success, this is gas production uh, basically every six months. The last year, Pennsylvania uh, produced almost 2.1 trillion cubic feet of gas out of, out of really only 3,000 miles. Um, it's, it's really uh, astounding. Some of the most productive wells in the world are located uh, here in Pennsylvania, Susquehanna County uh, in particular. And here's where they're at. So what this map shows is the thickness of the Marcellus Shale overlaid with the wells that are drilled. And basically, the larger the dot, the more productive the well is. And some folks are wondering, how in the heck can they continue to drill wells when it's like $3.40 an MCF? Well, if you've got a well that can make over 8,000 MCF a day, it's, you're talking in the neighborhood of thirty dollars to $40,000 gross a day, um, you, can pay that, you can pay back your five to $7 million investment uh, pretty quickly, within, within a year. Um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with one of the unique things about the Marcellus, um, with the geology within the same play. Down here in western Pennsylvania, we've got uh, a liquid-rich 
uh, area. These are like ethane, propane, butane, isobutane. All of these, these liquids are far more valuable than the natural gas itself. So we're seeing this throughout the country. In fact, folks, if you have access to liquids, you'll drill it and the, the, the natural gas is just icing on the cake. Another interesting thing I'd like to point out, all of these little red dots, these are all of the wells that are basically waiting for pipeline. Um, as I say, we've got about 6,450, give or take a few, wells that have, we're drilling has started, but only 2,800 and some uh, reported some kind of real production on them. The rest are waiting on, waiting on production. So the, the $2.1 trillion, $2.1 trillion, trillion cubic feet of gas produced all the last year, I predict is going to be um, surpassed again uh, this year. So, okay, all of that's great, but I work for the Department of Environmental Protection, and I want to talk about you know, those, the, that subject now. Um, and one of the, there's a couple of key issues. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But right now, the key issue for me is appropriate management of, of wastewater. Um, Karen did a great job describing the underground injection control program. One of the questions was, was um, is that the, basically the best way to deal with wastewater? And I will tell you candidly, I believe that it is. That the fluids, the salts, the, the metals that come up with the flow back, basically put them back where they came from, put them back in the ground. It's been done successfully for, for decades without incident. And it, it, it's a superior way of dealing with these things that even if you have you distill that water down, it's, there's absolutely no contaminants in it. Karen mentioned it. You've got this other waste stream that you have to deal with now. It's incredibly salty. It's got accumulations of radium 226 and 228. It needs to be managed appropriately. In some cases, it has to go to low-level radioactive waste facilities. Put it back where it came from and leave it in situ and, and avoid the problem. So I want to tell a story, though, about, about this waste diagram. So this, this was how uh, we were dealing with waste uh, before the governor and Secretary Cranzer called on the industry to stop taking wastewater to the sewage treatment plants, basically. Some of it was being reused. Some of it were going to these what we call zero discharge facilities. I believe there's one proposed here in Potter County. But then this industrial waste treatment plant, municipal waste treatment plant, and even this other in here, they, those, all of those facilities were relying on dilution to solve that form of pollution. They were not removing the, the dissolved solids within, within the waste stream. They were blending it in with, with treated effluent, running it through, marginally through some treatment processes. I mean, a, POT, a sewage treatment plant does not have the processes to really take out these salts and some of the, some of the heavier metals. Um, so they were being discharged to our streams. Once we saw a, an impact on one of our drinking water supplies in, in the Monongahela River, we saw the Monongahela River having elevated levels of TDS, total dissolved solids. One of those solids is bromide. And when bromide gets into a drinking water system, uh, it can interact with the, uh, one of the disinfectants, chlorine, and the organics in a pipe and create a carcinogen called uh, trihalomethane. And as soon as we saw that, the governor did not hesitate, called on the industry to cease taking it to these facilities that couldn't treat it. And they did it the next day. And here's the proof. This, this is uh, where waste went th this year. Reuse for fracking, zero discharge to recycling facility, disposal well, and this other, 1.5%, what is other? 1.1% of it happens to be storage waiting for disposal. So the other others are a handful. Like I, some of it is drilling muds that are included in that waste stream going to landfills. Um, we, we have achieved the success uh, that, that, that we, needed, we, we needed to achieve in order to protect the environment. So now Pennsylvania streams and rivers, you know, there's some discussion sometime about the cumulative impact on our streams. Well, if you have zero impact, you cannot possibly have a cumulative impact. Um, I can tell you can't, with, with all candor that this call caused the industry incredible consternation and it causes them considerable problems to this day because if you do not have an active drilling program, you don't have another well to take the wastewater to. So therefore you have to 
you're going to have to deal with it. And that dealing with it is starting to involve trucking and shipping uh, to states that have the disposal wells um, to manage it. So where, where is all the wastewater going? Uh, this, these stars represent all of the various permitted facilities that are, that are taking it, whether, like I say, as a, as a zero discharge facility. Here in Ohio and West Virginia, of course, we've got disposal wells. There's even a spot out, all the way out here in Michigan and some spots up in New York. Um, and this graphic shows percentage-wise where it's all going. So most of it's still being, well, it, Ohio is complaining that we're shipping all of our stuff to them. That's actually not true at all. Obviously, the vast majority of it is being dealt with in Pennsylvania, but Ohio taking the second largest uh, percentage share of waste that's going out of state. And then uh, West Virginia, a very small percentage there as well. <coughs> Um, so, you know, that would have been my talk about wastewater, wastewater disposal in Pennsylvania. There isn't really a, a lot to say. You heard Kara talk about the five disposal wells. That, well, there's seven now. Two of them just came online. Uh, we just clearly do not have the capacity. I think the two that came in on Warren have a daily maximum of 30,000 gallons for disposal. And obviously, if, you, if you're getting single well is getting, say, uh, one and a half million gallons back inside of two months, that's not going to cut the mustard. So uh, I, I also agree with Kara that we will see increased interest in disposal wells in Pennsylvania. Um, so now what I'd like, like to focus in on our basically, as I said, what some, some of the things that we've, we've done already, new initiatives, and, and, and then some, some new studies that, uh, that we're, we're undertaking. Um, first of all, just a little bit of background. I think the folks here are pretty, it sounded like pretty, pretty well um, educated, understand um, the rules of the road, so to speak. But that isn't, the, that isn't the case everywhere I go. In fact, one of the things that I really have to deal with is this perception that, that this industry is completely unregulated in Pennsylvania. And that perception, I think, is driven from um, the, some of the holes that exist in the federal federal laws that would otherwise regulate it. So Karen talked about the, the exemption under the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, for fracking. Um, there's also an exemption in the Federal Clean Water Act for earth moving activities. So, you know, if some of you planners or if you're engaged in construction, if you, you disturb one acre of dirt anywhere in the country, you need to get a federal NPDES permit before you can do it. And there's an exemption in the Clean, in the clean Water Act for oil and gas activities. There is no NPDES permit requirement for removing for oil and gas at the federal level, but, uh, but not at the state level. Uh, any gap that exists at the federal level, our state rules uh, have filled in. And so I just wanted to kind of highlight just exactly how comprehensively regulated every aspect of this industry really is. We've got three different statutes devoted just to permitting uh, wells. Uh, one of them I want to point out uh, is the our oil and gas conservation law. Um, that, if, have folks heard the discussion about uh, forced pooling? Where, okay, well that's Pennsylvania's forced pooling law. Uh, it's been around since 1961. It applies to wells that are deeper than the Marcellus. Just so happens they identified a geologic formation called the Onondaga. And the Marcellus lays directly on top of the Onondaga. So any well deeper than the Onondaga, deeper than the Marcellus, is subject to the conservation law. And we've got about 17,000 of those wells in Pennsylvania right now. Um, and of course, Utica wells uh, would be subject to the conservation law. Um, I think, personally, that, that a 1961 statute that contemplated that, this, just traditional well drilling, not thinking about um, source rocks like the Marcellus. And that's one of the cool things about the Marcellus and the Utica, right, is that it makes the gas. It is not a trap. It is not a traditional sandstone reservoir that is collected gas over the millennia. The high organic com content within the shale makes the gas. So it's not like a traditional reservoir. It, it is the pool, <laughs> if you will. So this concept of a pool or a unit within a black shale that spreads throughout the entire state just doesn't fit. Certainly doesn't work with horizontal drilling. Um, so this is one of those things where, where I would actually encourage the legislature to take it up and modernize the statute to envision modern practices, and also, I'll say, get, get real well 
space and concepts uh, in Pennsylvania for unconventional resources. We, we've seen in other plays where I think the, the record I've heard is like 80 wells off of a single pad. Um, so that's a very thick shale formation. They're actually drilling on, you know, on top of each other. But if you can do that, you know, why, why not develop every single shale resource off a single pad? Then you only have one pipeline. You can have a really robust waste management system right there at the site instead of having it be more um, you know, portable, if, if you will. So that's, that's my personal fantasy. I'm going to get off my, my soapbox there. So another statute I want to talk about is our Clean Streams Law. This statute has been called the most stringent environmental law in the country. Why is it the most stringent? It regulates every drop of water in the Commonwealth. Clean Water Act does not protect groundwater. Clean Streams Law does, as does the Oil and Gas Act. The Federal Clean Water Act does not, does not protect intermittent streams. The Clean Streams Law does. Everything, even a puddle, is basically waters of the Commonwealth, and you can't pollute it. Um, within the Oil and Gas Act, we'll just pause in a moment to talk about its sharp teeth, and that is the protection of groundwater resources. Um, if an oil and gas operator drills a well, I'll stick with conventionals, if they drill a well and within a year of the well being hydraulically fractured, and that can be months after the well is drilled, and you, your house or your water supply is within 2,500 feet of, of that gas well, and you say, well, something's happened to my water. And we come out, yep, sure enough, you've got chloride levels that are above the you know, 250 milligrams per liter, which is the you know, safe drinking water level. The operator is presumed to have caused it. They are presumed guilty. It turn, turns the traditional you know, notions of justice right on its head. It says, innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty until you can prove yourself otherwise. Um, so no amount of, of groundwater can be polluted, not even just a little bit, by oil and gas development. The Oil and Gas Act and the Clean Streams Law prevent that. Other statutes we administer, if you want to put a pipeline in and cross streams and rivers, you're going, need, you're going to need to get a permit uh, from us. Water withdrawals are also uh, managed by us in the Ohio River Basin. Withdrawing excessive water has a direct impact on water quality, and we can't allow that. Um, and of course, waste acts, air pollution control act, and even uh, laboratories that do work for these guys, they have to be independently accredited, certified by us. So if someone comes to your door and says, I want to take a water sample, the person doing it is working for an accredited laboratory. And if they do not follow the appropriate testing procedures, they're basically out of business. So the other thing I'll say about that, if you ever have anybody ask to take a water sample from your house, please let them do it. I talked about uh, presumed guilty. If you say, no, I'm not going to take a sample, that's one of the ways they rebut the presumption. So, with, But I want to be clear, though. I don't care where you're at. You can be four miles from that well. And if you think you have a problem, DEP will investigate. And if we say that the operator did it, they have to restore or replace your water supply uh, with good or better water than you had before. So just because you've got this presumptive zone does not mean that that's the end of the story. Um, so some of our, our, our initiatives that we've already done. And what I've highlighted here is my hierarchy of, of things I'm concerned about. Number one is public safety. And what does that mean? It means sound well construction practices. So we modernized our well construction requirements to improve this. In my, for my money, it is cement and cementing practices. Pressure testing well casing is great, but I really see that proper placement of cement, having good centralization of the well in, in the well bore, having that well bore be properly cleaned, flushed before the cement is pumped, and having the appropriate cement quality with, this, with the slurry designs that were requested is, is absolutely key. And our new well construction regulations uh, achieve that. The second issue uh, on the hierarchy is, is protection of, of, of human health. Uh, here, we're, again, we're talking about discharges of improperly treated wastewater. That cannot happen. It's not just a matter of, of facilities that were grandfathered. Any new facility <coughs> has to treat, treat wastewater uh, by this industry down to drinking water standards. Drinking water standards, so what does that mean? Uh, 500 milligrams per liter for total dissolved solids. And when you think about the ocean at 35,000 milligrams per liter and flow that up to, say, 300,000 milligrams per liter, I mean, that, that's a hell of a, pardon me, heck of a reduction. 
in the PDS that's uh, present in, in that wastewater. So you know, I'll, I'll check that. Air quality is another one that we're, we're very concerned about. I'll talk about the new, uh, more stringent permit requirements we have there uh, at the end. Next hierarchy of concern is purely like an environmental impact. And this is like erosion and sediment control. Uh, discharge of, of, of sediment to our streams and rivers happens to be the number one source of uh, impairment within Pennsylvania. And we take it really seriously. Um, I remember that some of the guys that, when they first got here with the Texas and Oklahoma license plates on, they were thinking, when we see mud, that's good news, because it's raining. Like, well, we like, we like rain too, but we don't like mud in our streams. So uh, we, we revised our erosion sediment control regulations. As I mentioned, you need to get a permit uh, to disturb uh, more than five acres of earth for oil and gas activities in Pennsylvania, unlike the exemption at the federal level. And then all the way down, I call it like Hermit. Does ever remember Herm Edwards? He was a coach for the Jets and the Kansas City Chiefs, a terrible coach, but he had this one saying I like, which is called, we're going to dust the corners. We're going to take care of the little things, and, and the big things will, will, will not necessarily take care of themselves, but we're going to, no, no rule is too small for us to pay attention to with great stringency. And that's data management, record keeping. Um, it became incredibly important, of course, with the, with the impact fee. Um, we had to wrestle with operators quite, it was, it was a heck of a wrestle, where they had told us that wells were drilled and they weren't drilled. Uh, they were reporting uh, waste and production on wells that had never been drilled. And we, so we finally wrestled around and got, got our records cleaned up so that uh, counties and municipalities got the money that they were entitled to uh, as a result. But as, as I like to say, you know, we're, we're never done. I mean, we are committed to a process of continuous improvement. And our, the rules that we've worked on are, are great, but we're still not done. The, the, the governor's not done. The legislature's not done. Um, Act 9 passed this year. I required DEP and Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency to promulgate uh, emergency rules dealing with uh, emergency response plans, obtaining 911 addresses at every well site, and, um, and having signs display at, uh, at all unconventional wells. So those rules are most effective in Jan this January, and uh, just provided what the, uh, the key trigger dates for the key components of, the, of that law is. Um, and then, of course, Act 13, a uh, complete modernization of the 1984 Oil and Gas Act, substantially increasing the amount of penalties we can levy, substantially increasing the amount of uh, bonds that are required, substantially increasing setbacks for unconventional uh, wells, and, and a number of other things. So uh, what's gone live so far uh, are what I think of as a world-class standard for site containment. Basically, we're talking about lining the pads completely, having um, chemicals, diesel fuels, all stored within secondary containment. So if there is a spill, if there is an accident, it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect water resources. It doesn't get onto the ground. Uh, the, we have some FAQs on what we expect to see on wells today. Another important change, from my perspective, is the requirement that folks get the well permit before they're allowed to build the pad. This is key for, for two reasons. Um, first, uh, we have setback requirements. And I don't want operators going out and building a pad and coming, in, and coming to me with a well permit later and going, well, I know I should have asked you for a waiver, but it's already there. You know, you're not going to make me rip out a $500,000 pad, are you? I don't want to be in those kind of negotiations. So now they have to get the well permit before they build the pad. It's also beneficial for the municipalities and the homeowners because you get notice uh, of, of, of the well. You might not get notice that the pad is going to be built. And in, in some of the worst circumstances that we ran into, folks find out they're getting a well. They walk out their door, and there's a stake in the yard, and there's a bulldozer over What's going on? Well, I'm building a well pad. I had no idea. They didn't own the mineral estate. They otherwise had no, no, no notice that this was going to occur. So that practice is, is coming to an end. And then another is uh, improvements in, well, finding a compromise in site restoration. We were adamant that we've got to shrink these pads down after the last well is drilled. Um, operators said, well, we're, we're going to be here a while. And with gas prices the way they are, we, we're going to, we want to take a break. So don't make a shrink, you don't want to shrink the pad down and build it back up again and shrink it down again and have all these erosion center control issues. So the compromise is that the pad can remain open longer, provided that you, you give us a plan to demonstrate how you're going to manage stormwater and how you're going to shrink down the pad afterwards. 
So in order to implement some of the key concepts of, that are in Act 13, uh, we needed to do uh, a rulemaking. And if you are interested in the rule, you can go to our Oil and Gas Technical Advisory Board website and get a copy of the draft. And that's what it is right now. Uh, we met with our advisory board uh, last month, and we are making some appropriate changes. We're going to meet again on April 23rd. There will be a revised copy of the draft on, available on the website then. And my goal is to go to our, our rulemaking body, the Environmental Quality Board, in July. So let me walk through some of the things that we're doing here. Uh, first, regard pertains to permitting. Um, we have an obligation to consider the potential impacts of wells on public resources. But the law, uh, importantly, was changed to actually allow us to condition permits to avoid any probable harmful impacts. So the rules that we're developing now outline the process of how we'll consider uh, potential impacts on public resources and how we'll move forward with, with, with well permitting there. Uh, this is a very substantial change in, in, in our process, but I think it's important if we're going to see uh, increased drilling in, in state forests and potentially on, uh, in our state parks where uh, DCNR does not own the mineral estate the majority of the, of the minerals in our, in our state parks. Um, the other things that we're focusing in on are management of waste at a well site. And we already talked a little bit about the, 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 the site lining requirements for, for unconventional wells. Um, we're also concerned about storage of waste in, in these large modular tanks. Um, folks are coming in from all over with, with the latest and greatest way to hold 2 million gallons of flow back on a well site. Some of them look pretty good. Some of them look like <coughs> I thought it up. So we want to make, have our engineers take a hard look at these structures and make sure they're sound. Um, some of our older conventional operators were storing their brine uh, in a pit. And that is, even, even if you take the best care of your liner in your pit, deer do not care about your liner in your pit. Turtles do not care that fall in and rip the liner to get back out again. So um, we are eliminating the use of, of pits to store brine. And we're also uh, putting significant restrictions on the ability to store brine in partially buried or underground tanks. Um, we're concerned about, you know, these sites are usually in remote places and they sit out there without, you know, there's not a guard sitting there. And we've had some acts of vandalism, so we're, 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 we're suggesting that operators take reasonable measures to, to, to work what I'll call a casual vandal, someone who is bent on, on getting that lid open is going to do it, but um, the, what I'll call the casual vandal is going to be deterred by some of the provisions we're, we're promoting here. Um, if you are going to store waste in a pit, uh, we're concerned about that the ground, seasonal groundwater table coming in contact with the bottom of the liner, so we're going to be requiring train, uh, certification by trained individuals that, that any pit used is, is above seasonal high groundwater tables to, to ensure better protection of groundwater resources. And, uh, and then for all operators, excuse me, we're, we're requiring all of the brine tanks now to start uh, implementing uh, secondary containment. I, I, I know that we've got probably you know, more than 150, maybe even 300,000 brine tanks, and having them do it all the next day is not, is not reasonable. So as they are refurbished or replaced, they have the equipment on site, they can build secondary containment. And, uh, and deal with them. I would say that if you go to an unconventional site, their, their tanks are all in secondary. More, more management of waste. We have um, very, very stringent requirements. <coughs> if you're going to store waste, we call centralized impoundment. So these are impoundments that service multiple well sites. Um, basically, we're building them to landfill standards. Double liners, leak detection zone, groundwater monitoring wells, um, very robust structures. Um, We've also, we are also for the first time now establishing standards for the mini quarries that are being constructed to build pads and access roads. They have, there's an exemption in the Oil and Gas Act for these things, but we're going to regulate them as if they were, were in fact a, a quarry. And then finally we want to promote recycling, so we're mm -hmm. establishing some streamlined processes for uh, mobile waste treatment facilities that are treating water to frack another well to site or treating water that's generated at the site. Uh, site restoration is a big deal for us. It's a big deal for those other support facilities, too. 
Um, the law does not mandate freshwater impoundments or, or these uh, rock pits or the centralized wastewater impoundment be restored. We're, we're going to be imposing that requirement in the, in the rules, similar to well site, uh, well site restrictions. Um, disposal of cuttings is a practice that's gone on since the first well was drilled here in 1859, and uh, we have not been able to document any kind of environmental harm associated with that. We have standards in place for cuttings that can be disposed of on site. If you want to do that as an unconventional operator, you're going to have to submit the lab results to us with the well site restoration report demonstrating that the cuttings are safe. Uh, I feel, I think that all but a, a, a minority of operators are actually encapsulating. All, the, the vast, vast majority are taking it to landfills for disposal. I mean, one of the issues is if you've got a six well pad and the well bore lateral is a total of, you know, 17,000 feet, that $500 fine has repercussions. It has repercussions because there are uh, competition for shareholder dollars. And if investors, to see a company in trouble uh, with the, the shift where they're putting their money and stock prices are affected. The most effective tool that we have, and we're actually using it right now with Carrizo, is to prevent people from undertaking future activity until we're satisfied with their performance. So right now, for example, in Wyoming County, we had a well control event, and Carrizo's not going to be fracking any wells until they can explain to us exactly how this happened and how it will happen in the future. Preventing, drilling wells in Pennsylvania is not a right, it's a privilege. And the governor has said that he will take that privilege away for operators that can't demonstrate that they have uh, what, it, what it takes to work in Pennsylvania. To what extent does DEP require the operator of a proposed zero discharge flowback fluid reclamation plant to demonstrate that the plant will truly have zero discharge before it's allowed to operate the plant? Um, well, first, some of them have, let me just step back, so if you do not have an NPDES permit, you cannot discharge, otherwise it's basically criminal behavior. Some of them get one of those um, because it, it affects which permit you get, either a waste permit or the NPDES permit. But the dis they could they could discharge, but they have to discharge at that that drinking water standard that I'm talking about. So they don't have the equipment to treat, so they're, they're just not discharging. Of course, we're inspecting the facilities uh, as well. Okay. And are there any public hearings required for the public to uh, challenge zero dis discharge claims of an operator? Um, The, you know, unfortunately, I'm just not familiar enough with that, that waste permit process. I, I, I want to say the answer is yes, that there are, well, certainly there's opportunities for people to appeal um, the issues of the permit. But I also believe that at, the, at a minimum, there's municipal notification um, for, that, for that facility, and obviously they can provide comment at that time. And certainly anybody can provide comment on any permit we're, we're considering. If they say that for whatever they have information to suggest that this is not going to be the case, they can submit that to the department. With thousands of shale gas wells drilled or coming in the future, what assurances are there that the integrity of the casing, and I was adding this probably to grow, will hold and protect water resources for decades to come? Well, I think one of the things First of all, I think the cement, cement slurries that are being used now are obviously better than they've ever been in the past. And we have, for good, good or bad, um, 150 some years of, 153 years of history showing that this activity can occur in a way that does not result in, in groundwater contamination. So um, we, we impose a requirement on operators to evaluate their wells quarterly. And one of the things that they need to evaluate is it is whether or not they see any signs of, of uh, fluids or gas coming up through cemented annular spaces. Um, and so far, I would say that of the wells that we have in the, uh, our inventory, all 
135,000, I believe. But we just don't see that, that, that issue where fluids migrating from deep, coming up, and getting into, uh, getting into fresh groundwater. What you usually see, in fact, is fresh groundwater getting into the well. Um, as I mentioned, brine is heavy. It's heavier than fresh water. The saltier the water it is, the heavier it is. All, all across Pennsylvania, we have that stratified result. Our fresh water sits on an ocean, an ocean of salt water all across Pennsylvania. And if, if there's going to be any migration of fluid, it's more likely to be well, fresh water going down into the well if there's a casing problem, as opposed to uh, salt waters and coming, coming up the outside of the well. There's a number of questions related to uh, asking about the use of acid mine drainage mm -hmm. water in the fracking yeah. process. Can you address that? Sure. I mean, we want to promote the use of degraded sources of water for fracking. Um, I will say that it's not going to clean up a dead stream. What it is going to do is avoid a, an impact to a clean stream. You'd have to pull water out of a dead stream 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in order for you to clean it up. And that's just isn't going to happen. But we're, what we're concerned about with AMD is, is, is storage. Um, it is not fresh. It should not be put into a, into a freshwater type impoundment. It does not have any kind of uh, construction standards associated with it. So we developed a white paper to talk about when mine influenced water can, can be stored in unregulated impoundments. And it basically has to meet the criteria that are outlined in that white paper. Um, and it's, of course, make it some, some pretty clean. But we absolutely want to see AMD being used. Um, it's a far better thing to do that than, than pull it from, from our pristine streams and rivers. Uh, when they fracture well, how long are the fractures go ver vertical and horizontal? The, the effective, I'll call it effective fracture propagation is about 500 feet. Um, you could have total fracture propagation of about, say, 1,000 feet. I'd say it's not effective, though, because you, you're, as soon as the, the fracking process stops, they're going to squeeze off again. That's why they have to use the sand to keep it propped open. So effective pro fracture propagation, delivery of propping into the, into the cracks, is, 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 is about 500 feet. And those fractures can, of course, go, go, go vertical. Um, but the, uh, the Tully limestone that's above the Marcellus is a very effective barrier. If every drop of water in Pennsylvania is protected, why can operators reach a private settlement with land <coughs> with DEP never being informed? They, that actually cannot happen. Um, the operators are required to notify us within 24 hours of any complaint they receive regarding uh, water, water supply impact. So if that actually happens, then the operators are violating the law. Yes? I know several cases of that happening in entire the county. Well, I'd like to know about that. Okay. I'll, I'll, leave a, I'll leave a card up here for you. Okay. We will, we, I will say that we will accept private settlements. If, the homeowner, if, if we have a, a requirement to restore or replace someone's water supply and the operator and the homeowner um, have come to some agreement, the homeowner says, I'm satisfied, I feel that my situation has been resolved, we will accept that. But that does not mean that we will accept a leaking gas well. That still has to be fixed. Yeah. Does that also mean that you notify people who live downstream? Yeah. Uh, downstream of what? Of, of the leak. Of the, if somebody's water is affected, they probably have a neighbor who's getting the same water flowing underground to them eventually, do you require that they be notified that they've got polluted water coming their way? Well, I, the, our gas migration rules require an extensive survey if that's, if that's the impact. Um, it, I guess it would depend on what the, what the issue is. So gas migration has got a certain type of case. The other type of uh, water impact that we see is elevated um, turbidity, iron manganese. So 
we, we do require, we, we want people to notify us if they see a change in their water quality that way. Obviously, if there was, if, if there was a, a leaking impoundment, we take it upon ourselves to conduct a broader survey around that impoundment to detect whether or not there's a problem. But I, we, we do not require them to conduct a, a geologic evaluation of groundwater gradient and then go notify everyone, however many feet down, down gradient of, of, of the water cycle. Jim, were there any questions from Elk County you wanted to share? Um, I just have two questions. Um, any other new technologies being explored for dealing with Marcellus wastewater? That's the first one. Um, you know, we get a lot of folks that are coming. One, one of the ones I thought that was kind of interesting is, is this uh, company is claiming that if they coat the pipe um, or coat the profit, that as the water flows over the coated profit and pipe, it will somehow entrain the radium in, in the formation, that it will not come back out of, of us as, in, in the flow back. I don't know if that really will work or not, but I thought that was one of the more interesting concepts that I've heard. There's a, there's a lot of folks that are talking about um, some kind of evaporative process um, using, um, another interesting one I, we were presented with was using bacteria to treat, to treat the, the water, bacteria that's found in your gut, apparently. I haven't heard from those folks again, but I would say we, we get a lot of visitors that have the latest and greatest solution but we just have yet to see it really really take off. Some of the more just conventional um, uh, evaporation, basically. Heat is, 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 seems to be the most successful way of really getting rid of it. Distillation. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, we have a more specific question. Why, under current DEP regulations, um, Class C effluent from a wastewater treatment plant can be used for certain agricultural irrigation, but must be handled as a residual waste on a drill site. And they're wondering why. Um, well, we have, I guess, you know, we, you know, this is a, this is something I'm not actually very familiar with, but just generally speaking, um, you, if, if we have processes to, um, either de-waste something or call it a co-product, say, but it's only for certain applications. And if you're not going to use it for that application, it's still a waste. So um, it has to be managed as such. But the way, the only rules that would really apply for this effluent would be storage. Um, you can't store it in a freshwater impoundment. It would have to be stored in either one of our uh, in pits at a site, tanks at a site, at a permitted tank, uh, at, at a tank farm, or at a, a double line centralizing pound. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily need a permit from us to use it to frack a well. Okay, thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Appreciate your coming. Yep, my pleasure. Okay, we are approaching 9 o'clock, so I think that we should probably try to wrap it up. Uh, Scott has offered to stay and answer questions one on one uh, as long as. as He's willing to stay here anyways. Uh, I would ask that there was an evaluation placed on uh, that on the front table. I hope everybody picked one up. If you can uh, fill that out, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, there is a place at the bottom where you can uh, request additional topics uh, that you'd like to have uh, uh, discussed in a pre future presentation like this. Uh, our next presentation is going to be in June, and the topic of that is going to be compressed natural gas vehicles and uh, whether or not that's that's something that's feasible and what would need to happen in order for that to become a reality. Uh, Scott, do you have any closing remarks? No, thank you again for the, op the opportunity. I know I was, I was long-winded. Appreciate your, your, your patience with me. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? I'll, 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 you're all evening. Okay. My understanding is there's a natural fault line extending somewhere from New from Rochester, New York, all the way down to Pennsylvania, and extending out to the coast in either Delaware or uh, is it shouldn't this or isn't this a concern for uh, injection wells? Well of course any any I'm not familiar with that, but I, I, 
could be. I just don't, I have not heard that. But as part of that, that area of review uh, evaluation that EPA does, they do, they are interested in known geologic faults that would, that would potentially um, intersect the injection zone. That's part of the thing that they evaluate. And I should also mention that if you didn't pick up a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, there are some on the front table as well. Um,